This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. We are studying the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm glad that you've joined us for our ongoing uh, study of this great subject. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Him, a citizen of His kingdom, then you are guaranteed to have both friends and enemies. Jesus had both, and if we're going to follow in His footsteps, the same will be true for us. And when you think about friends and enemies, it's certainly easy to love those who are our friends, those who treat us well, those who love us, those who are pleasant uh, to be around, those who have our best interests at heart. It's easy to love our friends. It's easy to love people who love us. But it's not so easy to love those who mistreat us. It's not easy to love our enemies. But if we would be like Jesus, then we have to take seriously what He says in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. How should we act toward those who mistreat us? How should we act toward our enemies? That's the subject of this section of the sermon as we conclude our look at chapter 5. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 38, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, and then we'll make some comments. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, without any additional comment, it's easy to see already that this is going to be some difficult and challenging teaching to apply. But apply it we must. When Jesus talks about how a citizen of His kingdom is to respond to those who would mistreat, here's one of the first things that He talks about, specifically in verses 38 through 42. He makes the point that we are to take no personal vengeance. And He starts again, like He has in these previous lessons we've looked at, here's what you've heard, here's what I say. And so what they had heard was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You've heard that it was said that. And that's what the scribes and the Pharisees had emphasized in their teaching. Now, here's an important thing to note. And that is the fact that that message, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was a part of the instruction of the old law. In two different places, you find that principle laid out in the Law of Moses. You find it in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and in Exodus chapter 21. Uh, and so when the scribes and the Pharisees quoted that passage or those passages, uh, they were quoting it accurately. 
Uh, that was something that the law stated. But in, in the context of the usage that Jesus is making of it here as it pertained to the scribes and the Pharisees specifically and how they taught it and applied it, what we find is that the scribes and the Pharisees evidently saw in that, in those passages, justification for personal vengeance. When in actuality, that's not what those passages were teaching. As a matter of fact, we'll go back and look at those two contexts and see that what you have there is not, um, is not sanction and authority for a person to take the law into his own hands and enact vengeance personally on behalf of himself. What those passages reveal is that those were sentences that were to be handed out in the context of a legal proceeding, in the context of a, a judicial uh, punishment that was being meted out on the part of those who were in that position of authority. Let's look at the passages. Let's go first of all to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19 and look at uh, verse 17. Verse 21 is where he says, eye for an eye. But the context in verse number 17 uh, connects that teaching with the judicial process. Then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And it's in the context of that, standing before the priests, standing before the judges, that he goes on later to say, here's how the punishment is to be uh, carried out. And in, in the Exodus passage, Exodus chapter 21, verse uh, 24 is where again you have the, uh, the statement about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But again, in the previous verses, you have the context. Look at verses 22 and 23. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him and shall pay, notice, as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Okay, and so again, this is in the context of what the judges are uh, meeting out as far as punishment is concerned. And so that's the context. It's not a matter of allowing for people to take the law into their own hands and do this personally, but it was for the judges to govern them in their meeting out of punishment in these situations of disputes and other crimes against each other. And so really, in a very real way, these passages were given... Uh, just as much to restrict punishment as they were to enact it. These were laws that were given so that in the context of meeting out punishment for various crimes that the judges and the rulers were given some parameters uh, that, that, were to, uh, that they were not to go beyond. So these were things that would in, in, very, in real ways restrict punishment uh, in, in addition to giving something that they could use to, to enact it. So the scribes and the Pharisees evidently had interpreted these to allow for personal vengeance, taking the law into one's own hands. That's what they had been taught. We go back and look uh, at the sermon, Matthew chapter 5, and you see that's the context in which Jesus is giving the teaching when he goes on to give them instruction about what they should have done, how they should conduct themselves, you see that he's talking about matters of personal vengeance to which those other passages really did not apply. What they should have done was remembered passages like Leviticus 19 verse 18, which explicitly says, you shall take no personal vengeance. So, if you had the scribes and the Pharisees looking at those passages through their eyes and, and coming up with, these, with the application that, well, this, this allows for personal vengeance. Well, it, didn't, it couldn't allow that when you've got an explicit passage in the same law that says don't take personal vengeance. The eye for eye, tooth for tooth was a matter that governed judicial punishments and was not used or was not to be used to describe uh, or to allow... Um, personal matters, personal vengeance. So what they should have done was take Leviticus 19.18 and harmonized it with those other passages. And if they had done that, they would have come away with the proper view. Uh, 
Personal vengeance is not allowed. It's prohibited. It's forbidden. It's condemned. These matters, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, govern judicial sentences that are being handed out by the priests and the judges. And so when Jesus says, here's what you ought to do, He says, for example, uh, when insulted, don't retaliate. Don't take personal vengeance. When someone slaps you on your right cheek, don't retaliate. Don't take personal vengeance. Turn to him the other also. You know, there's an old saying in, uh, in our culture where some people, you'll see it on t-shirts and sometimes bumper stickers and things like that, where the, 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 the idea is, I don't get mad, I get even. And uh, the idea is, you know, don't cross me uh, because I'll take vengeance. I'll get even with you. That's, that's the very idea that Jesus is condemning in this text. Don't, don't take that disposition toward others, that, you're just, that you'll just get even. As a matter of fact, that's exactly the opposite of how Jesus would ultimately act himself. Peter would write of him in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, that, that Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. 1 Peter 2, verses 23 and 24. Think about that for a moment. If, if there was anyone who was, uh, who, who was ever mistreated as much as Jesus was, I don't know who it would be. He suffered severely at the hands of his own creation. Ultimately, he was uh, tried on, on false charges, handed over to the Romans and beaten and ultimately crucified. And Peter says throughout that whole ordeal, when he was reviled, when they, when they said things about him uh, that were false and not true, when they slandered him, when he was reviled, he didn't return in kind. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Think about that. See, when many people today are facing various kinds of difficulties at the hands of others, when they're being mistreated by others, a lot of times one of the first things that happens is they threaten. I'm going to get you back for this. I'm going to get even. You know, don't turn your back. When you least expect it, expect it. And similar sentiments. Jesus never said that. Jesus never looked into the eyes of those who were uh, lashing him with the whip and who were driving the nails into his hands and feet. He never looked at them and said, I'm going to get you back for this. That's not the Lord. That's not the meek and quiet spirit of Jesus. So when he suffered, he did not threaten. Jesus never said, I don't get mad, I get even. And so if we're going to be citizens of his kingdom and live like him and follow his example, then we've got to make sure that we recognize that principle as well. Jesus indicates rather in the Sermon on the Mount that we need to be willing to bend in the opposite direction of retaliation which is what those examples in verses 40 through 42 are intended to teach, by the way. They're general principles by which Jesus is saying, you need to think about not only not retaliating, but going the opposite direction from personal vengeance and retaliation. For example, consider giving up more um, than uh, giving up uh, an additional garment when someone wants one of yours. Consider going the extra mile. Literally, when someone compels you to go one mile, go with him too. That was uh, a common occurrence, incidentally, in that day. Uh, Roman centurions, Roman soldiers could, by law, compel the common citizen to carry their, uh, their uh, weaponry or armor or other things, uh, could compel them to carry those things for up to one mile. And Jesus said, if somebody compels you to do that, why not go too? Uh, why not be willing to go beyond what you're asked to do? If someone who is legitimately in need asks for your help, be willing to give even more than they ask. That's the attitude of Jesus. 
Now, before we move on from that, are there limitations to, to those uh, commands in 40 through 42? Certainly there are. Uh, Jesus was not intending for these to be pressed so literally that they become absurd. And so let me give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 42, when he says, Give to the one who asks, and, um, uh, you know, and don't, don't turn that person away. Well, that passage was never intended to be placed and, and, and utilized in such a way that it comes into conflict with other passages, like 1 Timothy 5.8 for one. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If a man does not provide for his own, his own household, he's worse than an unbeliever, an infidel, and has denied the faith. Matthew 5.42 says, Give to him who asks. Well, what if somebody comes along and asks me to give them so much that if I did that, it would, it would keep me from providing for my own family. So what, what am I to do? Or were those passages intended to, to contradict one another and be at odds with one another? No, that wasn't the point. Jesus was not in, intending for these things to be pressed to an, absurd, uh, to an absurd level. These were general principles designed to teach the lesson of being willing to go beyond the minimum requirement. For example, just as another example, you know, if somebody asks for something, give them more. What if somebody comes along and says, I want your car? Uh, can I have your car? Am I supposed to give them the car and then on top of that, just go ahead, go ahead and give them the deed to my house too? And if I don't do that, am I in violation of these passages? Certainly not. That was never the intention of the Lord. He's simply saying, when you're mistreated, Instead of retaliating personally against that mistreatment, go the opposite direction and be willing to bend back the opposite direction and do even more than what perhaps you are being asked to do. So uh, exact no personal vengeance is the first point. Now in the second part of this, in verses 43 through 48, Jesus makes the point of the need for his followers to seek the well-being of their enemies. Seek the well-being of their enemies. And he starts again in verse 43 with, here's what you've heard. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now the first part of that, what they had heard, was true. The old law taught that. Leviticus 19 verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the second part of that about hating your enemy was not found in the old law. But that's what they had been taught. That's what the scribes and the Pharisees had emphasized. So Jesus is calling their attention to the fact that they had been taught something that actually uh, was not right. But where did that come from, this idea of hate your enemy? Well, I don't know for certain, so what I'm about to say is, is speculative, but I think there, there may be some merit to it. I'll offer it to you, and you can consider it uh, on your own. But perhaps that attitude about hating one's enemy grew out of uh, their conquering of the Canaanites when they came in to possess the land of Canaan. God had them, when they came in, there. They, God had them drive all of those Canaanite people out, those Gentile people. And uh, many died uh, in battles as God's people came in and took, uh, took that land. But that was a judicial punishment from God on those nations. And uh, the Jewish people were the, the, the arm of God's justice and judgment against those nations. The, um, the iniquity of the Amorite had become full, to borrow the words that God used with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. And when their iniquity had become complete and it was time for them to face God's judgment, the Israelites were the tool in God's hand to bring about that personal, uh, not that, that, that judicial punishment from God. So that was not personal vengeance and should not have been viewed as such by the Jewish people. And it may well have been that in the, in the course and context of, of the, the, the conquest and in the years following when there were battles uh, involving the kingdom, that this hatred for, um, th for the enemy uh, 
uh, grew perhaps in the people's minds. And that's it's one possibility. But here's, here's the point. Regardless of the reason for it, regardless of how it started, uh, the law of Moses required that enemies be treated fairly. So the idea of love your neighbor and hate your enemy, the hate your enemy part was not a part of the law. The law actually prescribed uh, a, a, different, uh, a different thing in one's personal uh, communication and interaction with those that were considered enemies. Aside from the judicial punishment that God used the nation itself as His arm of judicial punishment, in one's interactions individually with others, it was a different matter. Look in uh, Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, and we'll see here's how God said for them to treat their enemies. Exodus 23, 4 and 5. This is just one example. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you, lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So there was one example uh, of uh, what God prescribed for them to do under the law. If you as an individual are in, in, in a circumstance where you see the livestock of your enemy in need of assistance or one that's wandered astray. He said, you need to take care of that animal and get it back to its owner. In other words, don't, don't mistreat the enemy. Don't even mistreat his livestock. You, you help them out. You treat them fairly and kindly. That was how they were supposed to interact on a personal level with those uh, who even hated them, which coincides with what the Lord teaches back in the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, they had heard something that wasn't actually true, that wasn't actually the right way to conduct themselves. They weren't to hate their enemies. Instead, Jesus prescribed that they were to love their enemies. That is the word for active goodwill. They were to actively seek the good of those who were their enemies. Love, uh, bless those who curse you. Bless them. In other words, uh, speak well of them. They may not speak well of you, but don't you respond in kind. How different that is from the way a lot of folks act today. If someone speaks evil of another person, that person oftentimes just wants to respond the same way. Jesus said, you want to be a citizen of my kingdom, you don't act that way. You bless, you speak well of those who don't speak well of you. And then do good to those who would use you and pray for them. And those are things that we all ought to do. We want to be a citizen of the kingdom. That's how we should act toward our enemies. But then Jesus adds to that. Why should we act that way? That might be a question you have. Nobody else acts that way. Why should I act that way? Well, the Lord's response is that uh, is uh, in verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. Why should you do good things for your enemies? Why should you speak well of those who don't speak well of you? Why should you do good things for those who hate you and pray for those who would use you? Because that's who God is. That's how God acts. He says, you know, doesn't the sun rise on the evil as well as the good? Doesn't the rain fall on the just as well as the unjust? Well, yeah, it does. Well, who does that? Who's causing that to happen? God. God causes the sun to rise. God causes the rain to fall. And it rises, the sun rises and the rain falls indiscriminately of one's relationship to God. Think about the last sunrise that you saw and experienced. As that sun uh, rose uh, in the eastern horizon, and as it got higher in the sky and you felt the, the warmth of its rays on your face, do you know that the most devout atheist in the world, whoever that may well be, had his face warmed by the same sun? The one who bows his, his his back at anything uh, 
related to God and does everything in his power to try to turn people away from God, that individual enjoys the blessing of sunshine when the rain falls from the sky. It doesn't just fall on the lawns of those who are faithful to God. The enemies of God receive rain from heaven too. And God does that for them. And so that's the point that Jesus is making. If you are good to your enemies, you are showing that you are like God. You're showing the characteristics of your Father. Now, in a physical way, we sometimes um, bear the resemblance of our earthly fathers. I've had people say uh, to me, people who, who knew my earthly father, and they have looked at me before and, and, and said things like, I, I see your father in you. And I know what they mean by that. My, my father was dashingly handsome. And so I know what they mean by that, right? So um, they, they see characteristics. Well, people should see the characteristics of our Heavenly Father in us. And one of those characteristics is doing good even to those who are enemies. Now, some of God's blessings, of course, are safeguarded, and they're safeguarded for those that are obedient. Spiritual blessings, of course, being in that category. But there are some blessings that God gives to all people, regardless of their spiritual condition. God is actively good to His enemies, and that includes His goodness toward us when we were His enemies. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, uh, that point is made. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, verse 10, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, we were once enemies of God. If you're, if you're a citizen of the kingdom now, if you're a Christian, if you're a part of the body of Jesus Christ, at one time you weren't. You were an enemy. But Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. John said, you, know, you want to know what real love is? Real love is this. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. You see, He loved us first. We're responding to His love. He loved us first. While we were still sinners and in need of His grace, He loved us. That's who God is. And that's who we're called to be. If we only love those who love us, and we're only good to those that are good to us, we're no different than the rankest of sinners. We're no different than anybody else in the world. But you want to be a citizen of the kingdom of Christ, He's calling us to a higher standard than what we've been taught previously and by what the culture around us is like. Yes, it's hard to love, bless, pray for, and actively do good things for those that we consider to be our enemies. But that's what Jesus calls us to do. And how thankful we ought to be that that's how good He's been to us. You want to be a citizen of the kingdom, then we have to follow Jesus in loving our enemies. This is a production of World Video Bible School.